I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back to another Real Conversation to start off a new week. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's a real treat. It's going to be the first time, uh, Diego, that I ever uh, have had an opportunity to have a Real Conversation with you. So, so thanks for making the time. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Yeah, so unlike a lot of people on Twitter, or people that are like back and forth with me throughout the day, uh, Diego is a, a global macro man of all markets and he's been quite successful in not losing a lot of money. And we're going to get into that in a second and how Diego thinks about um, risk reward and how he thinks about running money in, in particular. But, but first, I just wanted to get your reaction. You know, today, uh, obviously, there's a big FOMO day out there in U.S. stocks. You're sitting there in Spain, Diego, of course, and, uh, and I wondered what your, what your sober take of it all was. Well, it's part of the rules of the game. I think, uh, you know, uh, you can either fight the irrationality or stupidity of the market or, or you can try to, to embrace it. And uh, I think, you know, fighting the, the, the market is obviously very, uh, very difficult, but uh, it's, it's part of the rule of the game. We are working with, uh, within a, a framework where, where central banks are doing whatever it takes, you know, create on the one hand the, the complacency that comes with this perception of the central bank put that they can basically uh, fix problems by by printing and and, uh, and lending and, and bailing people out uh, whereas you know this printing and lending and borrowing is, is perhaps more of uh, <laughs> you know delaying and uh, transferring and transforming and enlarging the problem down the line but in addition to this complacency that you might have and this fear of missing out and the, and, and, uh, and, and and also you know this idea of that uh, there's no alternative I think there's an element of financial bullying so uh, it's not just the complacency created is is how we've been forced in a way and and also how different players are being literally uh taken uh, back and forth i mean look at trend followers and quant i mean uh, it'd be we don't we don't have a crystal ball we don't know exactly who who, who is buying and, and and why but uh certainly uh i think some of the ctas uh have been in this roller coaster for a while they were max long going into 2018 with a very strong trend and low vol, artificially low vol, I would argue. They got completely taken out, got uh, short at, at the worst time, only to see them buying everything back and then do it all over again. And then here we go again. So I think, you know, these this, uh, strategies are uh, contributing to these uh, dynamics. And I think, uh, you know, my, my take is always to embrace the stupidity of the market rather than try to find it and, and to do that you know, I think the, the framework of the anti-bubbles and, and playing through optionality is very helpful. Yeah, I want to get into to your framework on anti-bubbles in particular because I don't think a, a lot of people have heard you um, have an opportunity to explain that uh, without just using the words or tweets or anything like that. But back on this financial bullying, I've never heard it uh, put quite that way, but, but there's, a, there's certainly in my inbox, uh, I have a lot of institutional subscribers, obviously, even they, you know, it's, it's on the border of, you know, you have the capitulation of, of course, by shorts, but you have, you know, the, the fear of these bulls missing returns where they have to chase returns, essentially. Um, all that wrapped inside of just what I think was, I think was a bubble. You wouldn't have this kind of behavior if you hadn't completely uh, unwound the bubble itself, because that behavior is quite bubbly. I mean, people chasing charts is not new, um, but you do have to actually eviscerate a lot of people's capital so that they can't come back with more. How, how, do, you think, how do you think about this period in time versus at least how I'd identify the last couple? I mean, 2008 is obviously pretty vivid. I don't think that this is like 08. I actually think it's worse. Um, or 01, 02. Well, I, th I think what happened, uh, I, I agree with you, this is worse. And, and the way I would put it is I summarize the last decade as in one sentence, is the transformation of risk-free interest into interest-free risk. It's been a process that coming out of, uh, you know, 2008, and, and uh, we, as I say, you know, the, the combination of monetary policy without limits uh, and, and to a certain extent, you know, the, the fiscal, but really monetary, has effectively created a, a situation where uh, you know you've you've been forced or incentivized to squeeze every every piece of um, of risk premia available, and uh, I think the, the big difference between uh, this time and that and, and last time is that by now the bubbles are too big to fail, uh, and we're in a situation where the rules of the game are changing, and and this is a typical uh, widowmaker in the sense that you know there is uh, a paradigm shift 
in, in global markets, which is happening in front of our very eyes, where the rules of the game of monetary policy and, and fiscal are, are changing because we simply cannot afford these bubbles imploding. And it's not uh, a bubble isolated in tech or, or uh, created by securitization and, and real estate in a few pockets. This is, uh, this is pretty much a bubble across different asset classes in, 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 in a level of, of size that we've never seen before. I mean, this transformation of risk-free interest to interest-free risk is very obvious in, in, in Europe, in the Bund, right? I mean, once upon a time, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the Bund, the 10-year Bund at 5%, right? And, and that was a great defender that, you know, if, if rates went to zero in a period of crisis, you would have a 50% appreciation on that. Right. Now where you sit in a situation where the bond is deeply in, in negative rates and, and the, the bubble you've built and the loss of defending power is, is huge. So I do think that we are in a new paradigm and these bubbles are the new enemy. So uh, forget about inflation being the conventional enemy, right? If you are a central banker, the mandate was, hey man, uh, we've given you the, the, the keys of, of the printing press. Uh, and as Voltaire wisely told us, you know, uh, paper money eventually converges to its intrinsic value, which is, which is paper, right? So without that central bank independence, the minute this thing goes and, and starts to be uh, used and, and, and abused, you get into a situation where willingly or unwillingly, we've created this serious series of parallel synchronous bubbles that are just simply too big to fail. So. Central banks are faced with the dilemma of, you know, do I let this thing implode or do I do whatever it takes to try to prevent them from imploding? But those solutions are not really solutions. <laughs> They're actually just delaying and transforming the problem into a, a possibly a much uh, more dangerous beast called, yeah. um, you know, stagflation. Well, I mean, not everybody's explained it that way either. You explained it beautifully. I mean, you're delaying and transforming and they're therefore making it bigger, the problem that, that we already just had. That's effectively 100%. what you're saying, right? I mean, you're just making 100%. it bigger and bigger and bigger across multiple things. Now, now some of now some of those things are not where you're at. Like, it doesn't matter where you're at, really, in this day and age. If you're running global macro money, it doesn't matter if you're in Spain or I'm in Connecticut. Um, they've not been quite been able to enlarge the, the a bubble in Spanish stocks, uh, as you point out. You know, German bond yield is is a lot lower than than where it was prior. But you know, the, the rallies in Germany and the rallies in emerging market Asia in particular. You have been fleeting at best. They've been great shorts. I mean, even uh, as of last Friday, you could have made a lot of money just booking gains on the short side there. What is it about this, I call it uniquely American FOMO, that somebody who's sitting there um, watching it culturally might think? Well, there are a lot of things. I think uh, Europe uh, in itself, I think if you, if you backtrack to 2008, I think uh, Europe, unfortunately, has been uh, or tends to be a little bit late to the party in the sense that, you know, you, you remember back in 08, uh, when, when the, the Fed was, was a first mover with QE, uh, as, as Bernstein was going down, the ECB was hiking rates, right? It was, it was the good citizen fighting inflation and being outraged by what was happening. What was sold to us as unconventional uh, at the time has obviously become uh, conventional. And then uh, as the problem in 2008 was sort of migrated to Europe uh, through partially uh, the, the FX channel. So you see the euro go to 150, and guess what? Along with euro dollar 150, you also have the yuan pegged to the dollar. Right. So Europe Europe loses a tremendous amount of competitiveness versus the U.S. and and China at a time when the U.S. is also enjoying a beautiful energy revolution. And guess what? 2012, Europe blows up. Surprise? No. Mario Draghi walks in and says, "I'll I'll do whatever it takes," but it's not just to save the euro is I'll do whatever it takes to you know, devalue the euro. And the only reason we have negative interest rates in Europe, which is, is back to, to the problem where uh, you're mentioning, is the Fed was at zero. Mm. I mean, monetary policy is a relative and contagious game. Okay, so at the end of the day, with the Fed at zero, how do I get, uh, how do I weaken the euro, this, this, uh, this balance, you know, uh, capital account, um, et cetera, versus, uh, you know, how, how, do I, how do I create this, a flow of, of euros out in, in, a, in a Germany that was already an exporter, you know? So, and I think this is when you think about what Europe had to do being late to the party, not only we embraced QE, we did it very late, we did it got farther with negative interest rates and we had to do it in way larger or relative size, which is subject to the law of diminishing returns. So if you combine that with 
you know, uh, Daniel Lacayo's point of, of the, on, on the lack of lack of innovation in Europe and, and, and excessive regulation of the things, you're really in a situation where it's, it's really this lack of dynamism. And, and I think in some ways we are experiencing, although uh, I might say in a, in a different level, something similar now with the new wave, which is, OK, now monetary policy is, is non, you know, non-conventional. Conventional is now completely conventional. We're going off, off the tracks even further. But the situation is moving into fiscal. So, what takes in the U.S. a, a handshake, uh, you know, to become to two trillion dollar package in Europe? <laughs> you see what we're going through, yeah. and this is just over and over and over. So, you know, I think the damage is already done in multiple places, and uh, I think in Europe you have this this uh, dynamic that is is endemic. Yeah, I mean, the socialization of losses, though, I, I do agree with the framework that as long as your country is the oldest, being Japan and, and now China, but Europe after that, and now the U.S., if you choose to socialize losses and create this massive, you know, the massive fiscal deficit uh, spending and, and, and couple that with triple-digit debt to GDP, isn't that just ensure your fate to the downside over? And I'm talking about an intermediate to longer term cycle. I think a lot of people, the whole problem with FOMO is that every day they're forced to react. So whether it's the, the President of the United States just you know, tweeted in all caps about the Dow or whatever, something about stocks. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Like that, that, and obviously there was, no, uh, there, there was no cause and effect of him doing that at the end of 20, uh, 2019 either, that you know, therein created the risk associated with the, with the ultimate collapse. But, but what is it there, like where you, where you have this, very, alongside the FOMO, you have a very short-termism, whereas you have these very obvious lessons of not only long-term history in cycles, but even the more intermediate term ones that are staring you right in the face. Well, look, as I said earlier, I think the, the, the problem with global macro to, to a large extent is that it's, it's a relative game. And it, it's a very cynical game because you, you're playing uh, effectively monetary policy always with a domestic hat. And I'm going to incentivize you know, my, my domestic market and my employment and whatever. But to be honest, uh, a, a lot of this game is really about the exchange rate and you know delaying and trans transferring. Right. So we can transform as well, but you also transfer right to your neighbor, a bigger than neighbor. And this is a situation where it goes in stages. So we saw effectively the wave of monetary policy play out in 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 a big way, and it's ongoing. And now we're going into into fiscal. And I think Europe, in, as I was saying, in some ways is kind of learning its way. They could see this coming. The reason why Lagarde and and the Guindos and these guys are at the ECB. They're, 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 you know, politicians. They're, they're finance ministers. They're guys that they're, they're not conventional center, central bankers because everybody knew the game was, hey, monetary policy. We're running out of tools. We're going to have to go big into fiscal. How do we uh, get that done? And I think th this dynamic, you know, let, let's let's take uh, one step further, right? So uh, the 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 whole trade wars at the end of the day, to me, is just a mirror image of currency wars. So I might say, hey, Keith, man. Mr. China, or, you know, I, I think you shouldn't be devaluing your, your currency. And uh, please don't devalue, don't devalue. But then at the end of the day, you know, two plus two equals four, you've been printing, whatever, and you end up devaluing the currency. You do that for your own legitimate reasons. You want, obviously, my, my investment, my, my, my money, my technology, my whatever. And against that, I might get uh, <laughs> inflation and, and, and bubbles. But you, how do you defend yourself? And the answer is, okay, mate, I can't control how, whether you devalue uh, by 20%, but you know what? I will tariff you by 20%. Yeah. And, and this is checkmate on China, right? Because effectively what it means is that China is left with the bubbles and the inflation without that competitive edge. And, and this is why, you know, as you move forward into this chess game, the whole dynamics of, of monetary policy are giving way to, to fiscal and also trade wars, which is all part of the same domino. Mm -hmm. And so I think in that sense, you should expect much more of that, and especially in an election year. Well, that, that in particular, I thought last week, I thought this was, I mean, that's why it was such a good day on Friday, and for to me, such a bad day today, just in terms of losing money today and making money on Friday, was what happened uh, you know, in Asia, in particular, uh, in China on Thursday night. I mean, once you start to see that we're, we're going to ensure that this trade war is the same as the currency war, which is the same as the whole big cycle, you know, then I have a higher level of certainty that the U.S. economic cycle cannot resuscitate itself on its own legs. I mean, I just don't 
I, I think that the market, may, maybe whoever it is, that, and to me it looked like some manipulation in Fed fund, in, in, um, in U.S. equity futures. I don't want to go off on a conspiracy <laughs> tangent on that. But you can really manipulate a market, as you know, in, you know particularly on a holiday and with thin volume and creating a narrative. Um, that China piece, you know, to me was always the place where I felt like I could, it, w when I'm going to be wrong, which is often, um, is it going to be that that I have wrong? Is China actually going to work? Is Trump actually right that this trade war is off? and that we're gonna sing Kumbaya by the middle of 2020. To me, the p probability of that almost went to zero. Do you agree with that or not? Well, I think China is, I agree with you that China is, uh, is at the forefront of, of global macro and is, uh, to be blunt, is, is the biggest bubble in financial history. Okay, I, and, and it will play out through the currency. That's my humble uh, opinion. I think a lot of what's happening in there and the dynamics with uh, with markets and and the short-term dynamics and everything else, it's is very difficult to play out, right? It's 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 their hands of poker and and lots of flows and things that are yeah. not necessarily uh, operating by the same rules, right? Um, so again, I, I don't think fighting those those numbers uh, is is necessarily you know the the right the right approach. I think. We, we need to embrace some of this as, as part of the game. And, uh, and in that sense, I think the, the optionality and, and, and the, and the anti-bubble ideas, I think, help me at least navigate some of this, this nonsense. Because at the end of the day, something's going to give. Okay? If, you, if you have a situation where valuations are artificial um, and you have equity valuations being artificial, uh, they are artificial for a number of reasons. One of them having artificially low interest rates, excessive liquidity, and uh, you know bailouts, a number a number of things that are effectively keeping this thing um, uh, artificially high. But as you keep art rates artificially low, as you uh, create excessive liquidity, as you will be unable to unwind this uh, excessive liquidity uh, because the virus will go, but the liquidity will stay. MMT once you go universal basic income and other things is very difficult to unwind. So what you get is other things will give in. Mm -hmm. So playing playing just one side of the, the game saying, oh, equities are too expensive, therefore I have to short this. It's tricky because, listen, how much did the Venezuelan stock market go up? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now, infinity, right? So at the end of the day, why would you sh short the, you know, something in total return terms when you think about other things? So. Think about treasuries, think about gold, think about volatility, think about other things that when you combine them, actually they give you a really beautiful um, uh, combination. And I, I use a, a soccer analogy, uh, if, I, if you allow me, being Spanish. Um, and I think at the end of the day, an investor portfolio, an investment portfolio is nothing more than a team, okay? And where you are the coach, you are the, the CIO, you, you, you decide uh, how you play. And I think part of the mistake here is that uh, this uh, mentality from investors that is what I call a striker mentality. They think, okay, investing is about making money. Okay, so <laughs> making money means capital gains, income gains. I I investing is about scoring goals. So you're playing a football match thinking, or soccer match, this is just about scoring goals. You're forgetting that this is a game of capital preservation. This is a game of protecting your capital and compounding on that capital uh, preservation. And in that sense, this is not about you know, I think a lot of people have been playing with 10 or 11 strikers. You know, think about equity, credit, high yield, EM, commodities, private equity, private equity. <laughs> they are the same trade. They are the same trade. And this is a risk that I call, and it's very important, is is one of the most important concepts I want to share today, which is the idea of false diversification. What does false diversification mean? It is confusing two simple things. It's confusing, I have a portfolio with a bunch of things, which is I have a bit of Amazon, a bit of oil, a bit of Argentinian bond. I mean, I'm diversified with uh, basically a portfolio that is truly diversified. The problem with is that when things go under stress, Q4 or 18 or in, in February, March, all this false diversification, this artificial low volatility, these artificial low correlations, it turns out to be one trade. So you end up losing way more money. So to me, the answer is really rather than fighting this stupidity of the market, it's, it's embrace it. You need strikers. You need goalkeepers, and you want your strikers to be as close to a call option as possible. You want your goalkeepers to be as close to a put option as possible. And this is what we do. I mean, that's why we're up 53% on the year, and we're up, uh, you know, even in April and May. And so considering we were the best performing hedge fund in the world in, in February, 
you know, doing well in this incredibly uh, FOMO, Tina, <laughs> whatever markets, gives you a sense of, of how we think through. It's, you, you need to have this, this, this approach where, listen, I know the market is totally rational on the one side, but I can't just play one leg because I'm going to get smoked. Yeah, that, that, I've never heard it explained that way. That's awesome. I mean, even for a Canadian who play, played neither uh, soccer or football. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to just boil it down to that, where we have all these strikers and everybody wants to get paid scoring goals all the time, when the reality is you started with capital preservation for a reason. And I think that most people just haven't been taught that, Diego. I mean, it's sad. It's, it's actually, I think it's kind of pathetic. Um, but again, if you go back to... Uh, even Warren Buffett's original uh, explanation of, of rule number one in investing, you pretty much get to don't lose money. You know, that's, that's where we start. And not getting scored on, whether it's hockey or it's, or it's European football or whatever it is, not getting scored on is the most important thing because if you're playing with the lead, then you can play more confidently, like you said, with, with more creative kind of players. Uh, in, uh, in, I'm going to mess, mess up my soccer analogies. But, uh, but, but to me, isn't that the point? Like when I sit there and I watch all of this, uh, at the end of the day, aren't we just watching, hey, look, if you had the right portfolio on coming into the crash, you can actually do a lot more right now. If you, if you came in with all strikers, you lost 20 to 40, 50, 60. I have some hedge fund clients that are gone. They call themselves um, credit hedge funds. That just means that they're a more levered long hedge fund. Um, it's unfortunate. People died. People went away. Um, but again, just the ability to play defense, is that maybe using your same analogy, starting with capital preservation first? It's 100%, because uh, let's put it this way, without capital preservation, there's no compounding. Bingo. Okay, there's, no e there's no income, there's no capital gains. I'll give you one example, okay? So let's say, and this is where leverage comes in, okay? And leverage being your biggest enemy, right? Mm -hmm. in, in, in a crisis and, and for capital preservation. And there are multiple ways to, to get leverage. But one example, and this is where the fallacy goes, right? You say, all right, I like gold. I think it's a good defender. And I like silver and I like uh, gold miners, and they're great defenders, so why don't I lever them three times? Mm -hmm. I will be an even better defender. So when the crisis comes, you know, and I lose a lot of money in the equities, I will make a fortune of my gold equities. Well, there's an ETF called JNUG, which is leveraged yep. uh, 300%, and that thing lost about 95 to 97% of its value in, uh, in March, okay? And effectively, by construction, the leverage means your short volatility. So whether the market goes up or down, if you do a big zigzag, you are completely gone. And what it means <laughs> is JNUG being gold miners and arguably being correct in the, in the medium long term, they were up 150% in April. Your, your whatever, five dollars, five cents on the dollar went to <laughs> seven or eight dollars, seven or eight cents on the dollar. This is the concept of permanent loss of capital okay once you go into permanent loss of capital you're you're gone so leverage it, it, and, and and i would we, we can walk through leverage i think this is a, a very very important thing yeah, i mean you sure. have obvious you have obviously balance sheet leverage right and and let's not get started yet on you know the equity versus credit game the, the corporate buybacks and, uh, and all sorts of ways in which, you know, there's direct leverage on what you buy. So there's a difference between buying a very leveraged name or, or not. So that, that's uh, level one. But level two is, you know, the direct leverage that is willingly taken by, by investors by, by effectively, you know, what I call, I want my 5%. So when my mom goes to, to, to the bank and, um, and they say, hi, Nieves, minus 0.5%, she's just like, no, 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 you don't, you don't get it. I, <laughs> I, I, I want five percent, and it's like, <laughs> well, how do how do we do that? And 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 the guy at the bank will say, well, listen, there's something called high yield that pays one percent. Why don't we leverage five times? <laughs> and then you go you go lever high yield goes down twenty percent or less because it'll be taken, and you're and you're gone, right? So it's not just how much leverage the individual name has; it's how much leverage you take. And I call that dumb leverage. That's what gets you bankrupt, right? But then there's other sources of leverage which are uh, very important. One is hidden leverage. And hidden leverage is the most dangerous. It's the one that you were not aware of. You, you didn't even know you were, you were taking uh, that, that risk. And this is where a little bit the anti-bubble framework comes. It's artificially low volatility. It's things like artificially low correlations. It's things like artificially low value at risk or the perception of liquidity and others. And this is, this is really when the system 
you know, the anti-bubbles prick the bubbles. This is the dynamic where effectively things get really messy, but not all leverage is bad. And, and in fact, what I was describing earlier is what I called uh, smart leverage. Smart leverage, when you have two assets that are strongly negatively correlated and both have positive expectancy, your uh, mix becomes incredibly powerful because effectively they're both offsetting each other and, and the process of rebalancing allows you to reset the team back, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, um, if, if suddenly your equities go out of whack and someone wants to pay 3,400 for the S&P, I'll give you some of that and maybe I'll use that to buy gold here. And if we go the other way and gold is at 3K and, 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 and the S&P is at 1,500, you want to do the opposite. So the contrarian nature and this idea of smart leverage, when you're levering these this strongly negatively correlated assets, is beautiful, but it's all about capital preservation. Mm -hmm. You need goalkeepers. And you can't just say, oh my God, uh, I'll play with 11 strikers and then when they attack, or rather, mommy is the referee, so <laughs> she will whistle offside before, before they can score. But, uh, so all these things are, are really, are really uh, dangerous dynamics that I think are important to understand. Yeah, because, I mean, capital, like you said, nothing's worse than permanent loss of capital. But then there's that, you know, elusive money on the sidelines or what is your incremental capital? And maybe using your analogy, I'll try this one all over again. Let's say that we only have three water bottles for the team. OK, so we know we don't have like CNBC endless water here. We're, we're operating with what we have left that we could reinvest or to your point where we could, um, you know, pour one out of the, one bottle into the other. So again, I, I, I book some gains over here, and I, and I, I also, t maybe I think about it a little bit more like gardening, Diego. Like, I call it, you know, planting and pruning. We prune some of the gains over here, so then we can reinvest some of that. Like, it's a good example, actually, today. Uh, no matter what you're long in equities, I like healthcare. I'd sell some healthcare here, and I can buy some gold over there. Because again, yeah. I have to keep my team hydrated. I can't sit there, like, with an all-one position with one water bottle with 11 players that need to drink it as soon as we get a goal. I mean, that's just not the way that you invest. It's not a reasonable thing for people to expect. And I think you, you, you touch on also another angle, which is uh, the, or the emotional side of things, right? It's we're at our best when we're totally unemotional about it. So to be honest, you get to the point where, oh, equities are up. Thank you. Uh, you know, the market goes completely nuts. You need to be in a position where you will be sufficiently exposed on, on, on the strikers, especially in an inflationary world, right? But then that, that pruning that you discuss and how you are effectively shifting your assets will result in, the rebalancing at the end of the day is, is an element of mean reversion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that mean reversion results in, in compounding. Right. So I've seen people, uh, you know, when, when the S&P was at 3,400 and gold was under pressure, some, some people would call and say, oh my God, um, I should be buying the, I should be selling my gold to buy equities. I was like, I think you should be doing the opposite. Yeah. Okay. I think you should be, and I'm not saying 100% of the portfolio. I think it should be back to your target. Yeah. And let me make a very important point. Okay. So this is, this is how, you know, a lot of, a lot of our clients, uh, have made their money with operating businesses. Okay. You might have a, an industrial guy, you might have a big family that made their money. And it's very important to understand and this is a, an issue I have with many of the advisors all the time. I say, listen, your client is a striker. <laughs> his business, <laughs> his income, his wealth, his everything, his savings are already correlated to the economy. You, your guy is already a striker. Why are you putting this guy into Deutsche Bank Cocos? Why are you putting this guy into high yield? If he wanted to take risk, he should be doing it in his own business. And the reason he has a financial portfolio is because you need that money. So I think what, what people don't understand in this industry enough, in my view, and this is how we designed our strategy, is the financial portfolio, it's really all about pro providing that defense. So I normally yeah. build these portfolios and I, I talk about 50, 15 strikers and goalkeepers. And people look at me and say, Diego, wow, you're aggressive. I was thinking of putting 5% or maybe 3%. It's like, you still have 95% in strikers. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is, it, it worked the last 10 years, but this is a whole new game. I mean, this is the, and I think, uh, you know, Howard Marks, amongst the others, I think in his recent newsletter, you know, which I got forwarded by someone because it was yeah. sort of echoing my, my, my thoughts. He was saying something along these lines. He said, listen, for the last few decades, I've really spent my time trying to optimize between, you know, uh, equity versus credit, uh, large cap versus small cap, 
emerging market versus developed market, you know, growth versus value. And this is just really, you know, uh, 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 optimizing your strikers. And, you know, finally, I mean, he said, listen, I've done a lot of thinking and I realized this is a game of balancing striking and defense, mm -hmm. which is what I'm saying. It's if you don't get the offense defense balance right, then it doesn't matter how your growth versus value is just completely meaningless or worthless. Yep. So, and I think, you know, the, the, to, to build your analogy and the water bottles, I think a lot of people would tell me, Diego, uh, I have cash. Cash is my defender. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, cash is the striker in the bench. I mean, it's really got some money that you put aside waiting to buy a striker. But when I talk about a goalkeeper, and defenders. I talk about strategies that make a ton of money when you need it. Mm -hmm. So again, we're up 10% in February, 19% in 0.1 in March, 16 and a half in August. And, 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 and the balance then is how do you protect the capital during the tough times? Yeah. So we're up 1.2 in April, we're up 5% in May. So how do you, how, how do, you do that? And, 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 and this is very tricky, but you have to have that ideally. And what I say is, listen, if you're gonna have strikers, Make sure they score goals. Yeah. <laughs> what What's pointless is, you know, the market goes in FOMO mode, and then your guys didn't do anything. So well, I actually I, I think that you need to uh, to 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 do that. First of all, you got to be you got to be good at trading. Um, you know, some people are like, well, timing doesn't work. That's that doesn't work in, within the framework that we're talking about. I use the risk range. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I use a risk range process that I try to teach people, which is when it's at the top end of the range, you sell some. Important word there, some. When it's at the bottom end of the range on a short, you cover some. And, and, you can, and the deeper you have in terms of options, in terms of not options trading, I mean, a, a bench of things you can do, the more yeah. valuable your cash is. You know, so at the end of the day, I think that's actually why you're doing, I mean, you're doing well for a lot of reasons. This takes, this game is not easy, and it's certainly not as easy as the 800,000 whatever Robin Hoodies that are running around with their hair on fire every morning, you know, trying to trade stocks. I mean, if you can actually go anywhere in the morning, Diego, and not have to do, like you made the joke, I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but Deutsche Bank Cocos, you know, c converts. These are like, if you, there might be a time where you'd buy that too. It doesn't matter. You know, absolutely. 100%. I got to have a guy like I got a guy on my team. I got this one guy on my team. He can he's really bad most of the time, but he's really good in a certain situation. And he's a bench player. And we bring him in for that. And, and on, in Canadian hockey speak, that's called a goon. You know, so, I mean, we bring him in and he gets in a fight and, that, and we needed to get in that fight. And they're not going to do what they just did to our strikers again. So I think that the, the bench, the, uh, the options of things that you could do, uh, when I got up this morning, I, th I started thinking about shorting the British pound, not chasing spoos. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it, I, th I think that that's what you have to and have I, is a deep bench. And I, and I think there's another very important thing, which I, uh, I learned, I mean, a long time ago, but um, going back to the football analogy, you are the CIO, you invest your money. When you invest money in someone, and, and you want them to play the role you expect them to play. Yeah. And there's nothing worse in this industry. The capital sin of this industry is to say, I'm gonna do one thing and you do something else. This is, this is unacceptable. And in fact, there's been a lot of mis-selling, I would say. So some CTAs, uh, just to pick on them, uh, and, uh, or trend <laughs> followers, they've been, in my view, missold as defenders. Okay, the idea is, listen, by the CTA, it's uncorrelated, and when the crisis comes, they will save you. Why? Well, they did well in 08. Well, 08 was a very prolonged crisis, and it was a very different uh, type of price action. What you see here, using the football analogy, is the CTA is someone that you're telling the guy, hey man, I want you to go and score all the goals for us. Okay, go and, you know, when the trend is going up, I want you to go up there, score all the goals. And, the, and, and, and with low volume, it's all in. Now, when they attack, I want you to run really, really fast, put the gloves, do all the saves, <laughs> and then later, I want you to run back and, and go. So the CTA ends up with the tongue out, max long at the wrong time, completely cutting the shorts, going short at the wrong time, and goes up and down. It's completely useless. It's, yeah. not a, it, it's, it's a great player. I'm not arguing whether there's, there's amazing CTAs and quant strategies, but let's not fool ourselves. He's not a defender, or yeah. at least in the short term. And this is what, uh, to me, is so important, is how do you play the role you're asked to do? So, and, 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 and we have a guy in our team that is, is, is an excellent striker. I mean, he, he's, you know, like, okay, high yield, and, and, and they, they're really good at that. And you want to have some of that in your team because you know that yeah. if you need high yield, there's, there's nobody better to pick these things and to do it. But at the same time, 
you you also need you know my role is goalkeeper so how, how do you how do you become a goalkeeper how do you do that and and there's certain rules right uh in, in terms of you know you can't be leveraged I mean, we talked about that you you can't be uh taken out you you can't be yellow or red carded you know through carry <laughs> so uh the proof's in the pudding i mean we have a a, a shared class that is zero management fee and 20 performance okay for tickets of, of five million i don't think there's many people out there with a uh, 50% uh, absolute return, five Sortino and a zero and, and 20. And, and, and this is something that we do because we're very confident that we are really about capital preservation. Yes, our goal is to do lots of saves and, um, and do very well when, when the, the, the clients need it, but let's not forget that it's, we have to be protecting the capital first. And if you don't protect the capital, then, then it's game over. So I think this idea of that we discussed rebalancing, having a, a deep bench, but also perhaps even more importantly, knowing what your role is. Yeah. As much as I could have views on anything, uh, uh, you know, my role is Diego. Your mandate is protect the capital, make a lot of money when things go wrong, and do it with neutral to positive carry. I know it's a very aspirational uh, uh, ambition, but that's what we said to do and, and what we're doing. And uh, and I think this is critical. Is do you know the biggest and positive feedback I got from my the big CIOs of one of some of the largest um, asset managers was Diego, you guys are doing what it says in the tin, <laughs> and that is so important, right? So yeah. uh, that's a that, that, that I think, and I'd humbly submit that that what Diego just said is the most important thing. Like when I started Hedge, I basically you know, we, I wrote this book, which you know looking back, I was a horrendous writer, but I did make the point that all I want to know is what is it that you do. That was my whole point, Diego. Which is, I want to know what the clients that I have do. What an, you know, what does an investor purport to do? What is their process? And do that. All right. It may not work all the time, but guess what? That's the process that you sold. Execute that process. So do what you said you're going to do. And by the way, evolve what you're going to do and evolve what you're saying you're doing. I think that that's important. You know, as the game goes on as well. But you mentioned one thing, and we're going to go to questions here um, in a minute. So again. Please pop, there's lots of questions here. Uh, because again, we have a practitioner talking here. It's not somebody who's just blowing smoke with no transparency or no accountability, uh, which is nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Diego. Um, but the point that you made, uh, to have a Sortino of five, you just kind of rattled that off. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, absolute returns versus volatility adjusted returns and what a sharp versus a, a Sortino um, a rank looks like? This is a very important point because, you know, uh, let's say investors that are less experienced uh, will judge the performance of um, uh, an asset or a manager first by absolute return. So this guy made me 20%, this guy made me 10%, therefore the guy that made me 20% is, is better. That's, that's not true uh, because the guy that made you 20 could lose you 80, okay? <laughs> so, the, so absolute returns are important, but they are part of the equation. The second thing you need to look at is when we try to assess the quality of PNL, we tend to call we we call them risk adjusted uh, PNL, mm -hmm. right? So or returns. So effectively, the, the, the most common measure is is called the Sharpe ratio, or also known as information ratio. So what you do is you look at the uh, average volatility of the portfolio, and then say, well, this guy made me 20% with 10 volatility is better than a guy that made me 20% with 40% volatility, right? So the, the sharp ratio would be 20% return divided by 20% volatility is about one. So in the industry, you know, uh, generally speaking, if you don't have a sharp of one, uh, you, you are in, in some trouble. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, it's, 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 hard, it's hard to justify the, the, the alpha. Now, the problem with uh, uh, average volatility is that it can be very misleading. So it works well for symmetrical distributions. So where, but what happens is, let's say that I'm just selling options all the time. So I'm collecting premium and I, it looks like I have a really nice strategy that is collecting money and money and money. And you're like, oh my God, such a great manager. Look, he's making me 10% a year and virtually no volatility and, and it's sharp so high. And then bang, <laughs> the guy gets completely <laughs> taken out through a tail event and he's gone. So be careful with sharp because it can be hiding a lot of risk. What you do is you need to differentiate basically between good volatility mm -hmm. and bad volatility, okay? Especially when the distributions are not symmetrical. So 
when you look at the return per unit of bad volatility, right, that, that left tail, this is what we call the Sortino. This is in football equivalent terms would be we've scored five goals per opportunity created by the other team, right? And the, the only way to do that is to have extraordinarily low volatility of negative PLs, right? Which, uh, so in, in that sense, you need to understand historical, uh, sorry, absolute returns, let's say sharp as a measure of, uh, you know, return per unit of volatility with the caveats and then Sortino. But you need a fourth dimension also, which is how do these returns correlate mm -hmm. to each other? And that negative correlation is critical. It's, it's not uh, uh, something that is, is uh, as well understood. So people don't go around, maybe we should create one. <laughs> right. Or at least I'm not aware of one. So, the, you know, the HI ratio, you know, of, 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 uh, of how, how negatively correlated you are to, to, to the S&P. And I think that element is also critical because, as I said earlier, when you build a team, that, that uh, team, uh, you, you don't need the individual pieces just to operate on their, on, on their own. What you want is them to play as a team. Mm -hmm. And that, I think those four dimensions of, of risk and return are critical because we often judge the player on its own right. Oh, it, it, it made a lot of money or you know, it had a high sharp, but you need to understand the hidden risks and, and also need to understand how they play as part of the portfolio. Yeah, I mean, and from a top-down CIO or a pension fund's perspective, that's what they should really be looking for is uncorrelated teams. You know, so you're one team and, and that Sortino is literally, quite literally off the charts. For those of you that don't know what that looks like, it just take the chart and go off it, a five is. Um, but again, you performed when you should have and you're continuing to perform. I think people would say, wow, if you perform there, you must be getting killed here in, in the month of May. That couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, you're still you're still generating uh, you're still ge generating positive returns. And when you when you think about the compounding of it all, that's just what it is. I have to I get a little frustrated with that, Diego, because I actually have to communicate it to a very broad um, specter of potential investors and people that maybe just started to do this. Long onlys that have started to think about short selling. Um, I assume you don't get frustrated by it because you don't have to communicate it like I do every day. You should probably, wouldn't you be getting excited about it given uh, how you could explain that to potential investors that you could have right now? Yeah, I think the important thing is to understand risk, right? And and the problem with, uh, uh, to me, there are two key build blocks or two key things that you need to look in the portfolio for potential hidden risk, right? And one is leverage, we talked about it. And and, and especially when when, you, you might have artificially low volatility or uh, um, artificially low, low correlations or um, uh, you know, a perception of, of liquidity. But the, the, the risk that, that we're looking at in, in, in these scenarios with uh, artificially low volatility is perhaps one of the most dangerous ones. And when you think about long short, okay, uh, this, is, this starts to be tricky. Right, I've seen a guy in my career with one million dollars of VAR lose 50. Right, and and this is the typical dynamic. And, and I is okay. I think Tesla is is a terrible uh, asset, and I'm going to buy puts, and I'm going to finance the puts by selling calls. And I always say, dude, you're not financing anything. <laughs> your long puts and your short calls. Okay, this thing just went up and you blew up. Okay, it's as simple as that. So. What I would caution, and I know that the, the investors are, the, the, the mindset of buying options, it's very difficult because they see the money out, but they don't see the return, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of see they're paying the premium and they go like, what if it doesn't pay? What's my carry? And they obsess. It's actually the safest way you could do it in the world to buy insurance, right? So I would say that as a baby step, before going outright short, I think it's much better to play your bearish views or even bullish to some extent uh, through options. The challenge is second order. It becomes carry, it becomes obviously what's the value. And this is where we specialize. I'll give you, I'll give you a simple, simple example. You know, when, I, uh, when, when you buy insurance, like a plain vanilla option, uh, let's say you buy a, a gold call or you buy health insurance for your family, right? Whatever it is, uh, th this insurance is paying under every possible scenario. An S&P put will pay you whether there's a nuclear war 
or whether you know China blows up or whether Trump loses the election, it will pay under any scenario. But what we do, we specialize in options, and sometimes these options are indeed quite expensive. So mm -hmm. a three-year call option would cost you, for the sake of argument, 15% premium. Okay, this is a big problem because 15% premium is a lot of money. Second, even if you're right and gold is up 50%, you barely made three to one on your money, which I don't think is enough. And third, if you're wrong or early, you will bleed like 5% per annum, assuming it's linear. So as bullish as I'm gold, I look at a vanilla cold on gold and say, listen, 15%, massive negative carry and the payoff is not good enough. What can we do? How can we structure this in a way that I reduce the premium, increase the payout and improve the carry? And one of the opportunities we've had over the last couple of years is effectively playing the correlation between gold and the dollar. So I would ask the market, hey, Mr. Market, what's your view on gold? And they said, yeah, sure. The uh, expected value over three years, 15%, you know, okay, what's your view on the dollar? And the market would say, Diego, really easy, gold up, dollar down. And I go, really? How about a scenario, gold up, dollar up? And the market would say, no, mate, impossible. Yeah. <laughs> you, you look at the financial model, you had backwardation in the, in, the, in the forwards, you had positive carry, you had the skews. So lots of things that are a bit technical, but when you add them together, effectively you're able to cheapen your hedge by 80 or 90%. So I still might be my, long my gold call, but by making it contingent on the dollar, effectively you, you cheapen it up, you improve your, your, your multiple to five, 10, 20 to one, and you do with better carry. So I think in that sense, I would encourage people to, to study and read more about options as a baby step to, yeah. to, to, to try to trade in a safer way. Because the beautiful, I mean, my strategy, we only buy options and this is the, you know, one thing that people scratch their heads is like, yeah, but maybe you should be, no, we only buy options because we like sleeping at night. <laughs> okay. And what happens is that when you buy options, the worst thing that could happen is that you lose your premium. Mm -hmm. So you could have a five year view and play it through an option. And I don't care if, if I buy 3000 puts on the S and P for five years and the S and P goes to 10,000, I'm still alive. If, if the S and P comes back down. So, when you're actually in a way uh, fighting the market by being short, you will be 100% taken out in many cases with these bubbles, right? They, as, the, as the saying goes, bubbles tend to go farther and longer than most people anticipate, but they also collapse uh, a lot farther and, and, and probably a lot deeper. So I think it, in my experience all these years, you know, since the, the 97, 98 crisis, which was my first baptism of fire, uh, <laughs> and I just revealed my age, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that we've, we've learned through the cycles. And, and in my personal journey, I found, and this is something that there's no right or wrong, by the way. I think my personality is different to yours and others. And in my particular case, I feel very comfortable buying options because I know that I have one year or two or three years or whatever to be correct. And I know that whatever happens, I know my downside. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what we do. But listen, there are incredibly smart people that make a lot of money doing exactly the opposite. So mm -hmm. in that sense, I think it's really about finding your whatever fits your personality. But I'd be very, very careful with leverage and, and with outright open risks such as shorts. So I think options is probably something people should should start studying and maybe implementing a bit more, even if it's not the easiest thing to do as a retail guy, because all the questions are going to come. How do I buy these options? And unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's not as easy to do. And that's where, you know, we as a as a, as a professional uh, manager with access to, to, to the markets, we, we can do these things more tailored. But cool. nevertheless, I think vanillas could add value as well. Well, the way the way you really learn is by doing it, by trading options. So, I mean, um, this day and age, I think it's wonderful. I mean, you can trade most platforms, electronic platforms are letting you trade options for 50 cents. That's a lot cheaper in terms of your education. Uh, your education is going to be losing money. Don't forget that that's what, uh, for all of you that haven't tried it yet. Um, again, and there's, they've, they've actually made electronic trading. You know, you can have paper counts with options, stuff like that. But I'd encourage people to do it. Actually, the, the fund that um, resembles the hedge eye strategy most closely, Serpinski Capital, uh, the manager there, Marcus, uh, again, taught me, look, he's, he's like, hey, uh, I can I can really augment you know your process using options. So you know even me like I mean I'm, I'm in the COVID experience. I've had a lot of opportunity to you, know, you constantly teach yourself new option strategies by screwing up. I do. I mean um, I certainly if I had to show all those timestamps, Diego, people would lose their minds. 
I'm trying to give them like you know timely timestamps on basic stuff like TLT and GLD. Once I get into options, that would just create create a you know, that would create a cluster. Um, first question actually has to do with your um, with with all of your experience. By the way, uh, this is a good one. Uh, greetings, Diego, from a former Goldman and Merrill Lynch colleague of yours. Your main theme for anti-bubble investment is gold. How do you position your book on gold between derivatives? This is actually basically what you're just, extend that into the positioning, I guess. Uh, how do you position your book on gold between derivatives, allocated, unallocated, and actual physical? Well, greetings to my former colleague. And um, uh, I think, you know, the, the strategy, as I said, is, is done in a way that there's a lot of debate, but long story short, I think you want to have, as you mentioned earlier, the, the optionality to have all these pieces to play. So in our case, we favor gold versus other precious metals and also versus miners. But we do have the ability to, to actually rotate across them. So the first thing we do is we have roughly 50% of the portfolio in precious metals, which is primarily gold. But we also have silver, platinum, palladium, or even gold miners, but on a rotation basis, so no shorts. Okay, So this is more about uh, rotating the, 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 the team. The second thing that we do is we add a put overlay. So this is a very important analogy. So I, I use, uh, I, I compare managing money to climbing a mount, mountain or climbing a wall. So what happens is, let's say you're up five or 10 or 15 meters. What you see is what you do in the mountain is, is not a race to the top. It's not even about getting to the top. Uh, it's about making it back to the bottom, right? Yeah. So you, you will pin yourself to the wall, right? You will just pin yourself, keep climbing, and some uh, climbers will look at you and say, oh, man, you're, you're wasting money and time, you know, <laughs> pinning yourself to the wall. And you're like, well, especially if there's a guy called Trump or she throwing you rocks or a crazy CTA that is likely to come and, and, and pull you down. So, so the puts actually, what it means in, in, in derivatives terms, if you convert a core long position with no leverage and some rotation, by buying the put, you really created a, a call option. So what, what you want is to have some sort of rolling synthetic call. What, what does it mean? When you're going up, you go up, you may make a little bit more money. But when the market goes down, you cash in your put. And with that money, you buy more gold, which, by the way, is cheaper then, and you buy more puts. Mm -hmm. And what it means is that you're to put in numbers, right? $100, you might, I may have spent $1 in insurance. If the market goes to 80, my put pays me $20 in cash, and I use those $20 to buy more gold at 80. As a result, I may have, let's say, for the sake of argument, 120 ounces. So when gold goes back to 100, I'm not just making it back and forth. I compounded on that capital preservation. Yes. So this, this piece, this idea, I call that smart gold. So the rotation plus the long put. And the third thing that we do, and this is the most important thing about the strategy, is we, we buy insurance. But and as a goalkeeper, I have two choices here. How, as a goalkeeper, you can either put options, buy put options on risk assets, so call it um, equity, credit, high yield, EM, commodities, so assets that will call a fall in a crisis, or I could also be buying call options on assets that are uh, anti-crisis, anti-bubble, um, et cetera. So this is gold, treasuries, the dollar, or the VIX. So the beauty is that when you buy these options, and you, you could do it vanilla, if the market wants to give you, you know, uh, puts on the S&P at a VIX of 10, thank you. You might you might want to take that. But when the volatility is more expensive, you might look for more creative ways, as, as we described. But the important thing is that by combining a core long with no leverage, no shorts, with relative value, with a long put overlay, and with a, a long call, this becomes uh, very, very, very efficient and, and potentially, hopefully, uh, very explosive as well. Especially in a, in a bull market that has falling volatility, you know, case in point, something like treasuries or gold. I mean, gold, gold volatility is down at 20 today. It makes doing something like that, you know, there's no layups, as you know. But I, I think of this as just make high probability bets as many times as you possibly can. You know, if you're using put spreads, that'll work. If you're, you know, again, the way you articulated that, I think to a lot of people, it takes away from the boringness of being the goalie or, or defense. Like quite literally, the 10-year yield on treasuries is traded in a 15 basis point range, and you could have made a shitload of money for the last two months with the yield doing absolutely nothing. Yeah, I think, listen, volatility, there are two, two big schools of thought in volatility. Okay, to, when, when you think about volatility trading, there are what I call on the one hand the, the Black and Scholes boys, mm -hmm. and there are what I call the Monte Carlo boys. 
So what, who are the, the, the Black and Scholes boys? The Black and Scholes boys and girls are people who effectively think about options as, well, the premium equals the trade-off between uh, uh, theta, d decay, and, and gamma hedging. So you have a portfolio that is delta hedged, and you basically trade the implied versus realized. So uh, the problem with this is that and you're, every day you're delta neutral. So let's say that uh, gold, you know, you buy a, a one month gold call for 1%. As a, as a uh, Black and Scholes guy, Keith, you will say, Diego, I want you to trade the volatility. I don't want you to be directional. So what it means is I cannot be directional, so I delta hedge it. Now, let's assume, for example, the market went up 1% every day for the whole month, like 25% on the month. Every day I've been hedging a bit of my delta, right? But I had zero opportunities, zero, to buy back my gamma, to buy that back and trade the volatility. So what it means is that at the end of the month, gold is up 25%, and you know I had effectively the realized volatility of a straight line is zero. So I may have bought a very cheap call, but if the realized volatility was zero, I may have even lost money. And this is the way, when you think about volatility traders, it creates this basis risk. The other way to think about options, which is very helpful, is you think about, instead of using Black and Scholes model, you do what is called a Monte Carlo simulation right. in, in, because of the casino. So you run 100,000 iterations and you say, based on this volatility and correlation, what can happen, right? And turns out that the expected value of that option, surprise, surprise, is identical to Black and Scholes by, by construction. But the difference here is, the, the point is this, if I bought a call option for 1% and I went on holiday for a month and I came back and said, hey, Keith, by the way, what happened to gold? It's like, well, it's up 25%. I made 25 to 1. So one guy was trading the implied realized vol. It's a, it's a path dependent kind of dynamic game. And that works really well in scenarios where the market that, that you just described. So that's trading the volatility. But I think about options more as insurance. And when you know, so I think more in premium. To me, a million dollars in puts on the S&P competes with a million dollars in calls on treasuries. Mm -hmm. Which one is better? Well, ex ante, we don't know. But this is where you may find opportunities because the volatility in the S&P, the put skew might be uh, super high. So the risk reward you get on those puts is not as interesting as maybe doing calls on gold. Or you could do things like what we do, which is combining the two. You might say, okay, I'm gonna do like a cheapest to deliver, what is called the worst of. I might do a call on gold uh, or a put on the S&P. I, I do both. And you say, which one do you want? It's like, I don't mind. I'll take either one. Mm -hmm. and, and this is incredible because you can cheapen up your options brutally, you know, from 13% the S&P put and 10, 11% on the, on the gold call. You can buy these things for less than 3% mm -hmm. by, by making it on a worst, a worst of basis. This is the beauty of the mathematical models. The mathematical models predict certain paths they look at implied volatility correlation, but when you actually are able to, to, to construct, you know, tailored solutions, this is, as you said, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we, we, we certainly uh, enjoy uh, doing this and, and we're constantly of the look for optionality that will protect our clients and will allow us to do it in the cheapest, most explosive, uh, best carry possible way. And you've done you've done it very well this year. Uh, last, I, I guess I, I I don't I don't want to end this conversation, Diego, but uh, I have to ask the last question because our, our our clock is up. A lot of questions about a couple things, so I'll combine them into one, uh, having to do with okay when the bubble bursts, for example, that's you know part of it, but also what you said on China, and and I think you've called I think you've called it uh, China Lehman squared, so to speak. So I guess maybe wrap that into maybe a final question on 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 what it is that you think the the bubble that is China and how how one could capitalize on it bursting. So I'll start by saying that in my view, China is, is a semi-open and by semi-closed economy. So they do trade with the world, but they do it with lots of rigidities like the, like the exchange rate. So in that sense, China, every time that they're faced with a problem, they always do the same thing. They print money, they lend it, and they bail people out. So if, if a real estate developer blows up, suddenly it becomes a state owned, right? Uh, a few weeks ago, there was an interesting tweet that said China, PBOC, the Central Bank of China, injects $7 billion into the banks. And I said, no, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they injected 50 billion yuan. They can't print yuan, 
but you cannot print dollars. Right. So you can bail whoever you want. You can bail the, the oil companies, you can bail the, the everybody by, by printing money. Now, because that money cannot exit the system because the foreign exchange is controlled, what it means is that this liquidity flows like water, literally, and goes into creating bubbles, such as real estate, overcapacity, infrastructure, and of course, inflation. So this dynamic, where two plus two equals four, and this, you know, China's obsession with rigidity, I compare it to a, a skyscraper of concrete. It would not last five minutes in Tokyo, okay? It might look very sturdy, but that obsession with rigidity is actually fragility. The, mm -hmm. the skyscrapers in Tokyo are like rubber. So what happens is that as these imbalances accumulate, and don't get me started with shadow banking and other, other credit issues, what it means is that degree, the degree of freedom in which China, in my opinion, will implode is through the FX rate. Mm. And this is where everything goes back to China trying on the one hand to capture your investment, your technology, your employment, your factories, your everything. And then on the other hand, having a trade off with bubbles and inflation It's worked really well for them. But if you cut it with trade wars, this is extraordinarily bad news for, for China. So if you look at the FX rate, you can fight and say, well, technology companies, I'm going to delist you. How does China respond with some technology stuff? Right. So they defend themselves using the same weapons. But once we go into trade, this is the real issue. And this is where I think China is, is, is very weak and why they fold it. So I, I think it's I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, when I called, you know, with Daniel Lacalle, you know, oil was 120. The market was calling for peak oil and we're calling for 30 to 50 oil. We, we sounded like lunatics, you know, gold, uh, same thing with my, my article on the front page of the FT calling for three to 5,000 gold at, at 11, 1200 also sounded. I think China, the kind of dynamics that we're seeing may sound like science fiction to some people, but in my view, is, is Lehman squared. It's, it's a crisis that I, I 100% and sincerely hope I'm wrong because it's, it's just uh, way, way larger than anything we've ever seen. Well, your strategies and, and your anti-bubble theme, I mean, really uh, just labeling that has been brilliant. I mean, it's not, it's, as you know, this is a long game and it's not, not easy to use the soccer or the European football analogy to, to win championships, but you're having one of those years and that's, that's a great thing because champions you know, can, can feed on that, build that culture, teach people what they do. I think you did, you did a great job explaining your process today. And uh, I certainly thank you for that. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Keith. Thanks. He's Diego. I'm Keith. We're still here, and that FOMO is still out there. Hopefully, you can capitalize on it. Thanks for joining us.